I'm 18 years old, and I don't have any scientific research. I've never traveled out of the country. I don't even know where I'm going to college yet. But there is one thing I can talk to you about. And let me tell you, I can do this one thing really well. In fact, I can do it so well, and I enjoy it so much, that I decided to do a little experiment with it. Near the end of my junior year in high school, I set off on this journey. A life-changing journey, really. I've never looked back, and I've never regretted it. You see, this incredible life-changing journey was to make 1,000 paper cranes. Now, before I begin telling you my story, let me tell you that making 1,000 paper cranes definitely isn't easy. It takes skill, patience, and a whole lot of paper squares. So I started making these cranes, and at first, it was no problem. I'd make two or three here and there. I'd make a few in class, on long car rides, at social events. Spend my Saturdays making paper cranes. But then, I came across a problem. After about two or three months, I knew I had made at least 300 cranes. But when I went to count them, I only had 53. You see, the problem was that I wasn't actually keeping them. Instead, I would leave them on desks at school, at restaurants, and just randomly give them away. Now, when I would explain to people what I was doing, they typically did one of two things. They either stared at me blankly or laughed at me. So sometimes I would explain how I got into making paper cranes to begin with. You see, I started making cranes to get out of my habit of picking my nails. After my sister Nicole taught me how to make a crane, I realized that it was an easy replacement to do when I was nervous or needed something to do with my hands, like right now. So, <laughs> so after explaining this, one person looked at me and said, okay, okay, so I understand why you're making them, but why are you giving them away? Rachel, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to keep them so you can reach your goal of 1,000. Now, I started thinking, and this seemed a lot like how I'm supposed to go to college, and I'm supposed to choose a major as a 17, 18-year-old, hopefully get a prestigious job that earns a lot of money, and ultimately, I'm supposed to live up to societal ideas of success. So I'm currently in the college selection process, and I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to major in. I could maybe be an engineer or an architect, I've been told, though, that I need to choose a rigorous major, like that engineer or maybe a lawyer or a doctor. But what if I want to be a teacher or an artist or mother? That's just not acceptable. So I realized that every single time I've met someone for the first time, almost the first things they ask me is, what sports do you play? Or where do you go to church? Or what are you going to major in? Now, the awkwardness that comes out of some of these conversations is to an entire new degree of being uncomfortable. Especially when I reply, oh, I don't play sports, I do community service, and I actually don't go to church, I go to synagogue, and I really love doing math for fun, and I don't really like dressing up, and sometimes I prefer drawing over going to sports games, and I think it's okay if you want to be that teacher or an artist or mother. But that's not how it's supposed to be. And sometimes the conversations end at those replies. But then there are those special people who look at me and say, me too, or tell me more. These are the people who you need to keep an eye out for, the ones who avoid ignorance with simple questions and are eager to delve into the uncomfortable zones of the unknown and the different. And that's exactly what I'm doing today as I speak, because I am doing exactly what I was told was weird, not normal, and out of my league. Exactly what I was told not to do. Let me explain. When I was in fourth grade, my teacher pulled me aside and told me not to talk as much in class, share my opinion, answer questions, because that's what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to sit quietly and let others have a chance which typically ended with a silent classroom. 
For me, though, this was a huge problem because I love asking questions and being silly and being creative. So to be told not to participate as much in class really diminished me and my personality. From then on, I was often labeled as the quiet one. And unless you knew me well, I was probably still labeled as that or something similar. Now, back in elementary school, I was waiting on a hero. I was wishing for a hero, someone to tell me that it was okay to be myself, to share my opinion, to answer questions, to own my personality and my ideas, to tell me that everything's gonna be okay, that I have more supporters and enemies, that I can actually change the world. But that hero never came until the end of my junior year. Now, yes, I have role models and people I look up to, but that hero, the one I had been waiting on, didn't come until recently. I needed a hero, so I became one myself. I threw away the misconceptions, the labels. <laughs> Thank you. I threw away the misconceptions, the labels, my labels, and decided to look at what was right in front of me. I decided that I had no right to complain about something if I didn't try to fix it first. We all know that saying, it could be worse. But you know, I think it can also be better. And it's up to us to make it better. So I set off in our community, tutoring after school, building houses for Habitat for Humanity, holding a position on a nonprofit, having a philanthropic summer camp at my house. And every single time there was someone or something trying to stop me. You can't do that. You're too young. You don't have time. Girls can't use hammers. <laughs> but every time I proved them wrong. Being a teenager in the society with more options and rigor than ever before, I realized that I had to do what I wanted to do and what I thought I was capable of which was certainly more than what most people expected from a high school girl. I decided that it was time to stop doing what many people around me pretended to like and to start trying to change some things. Even if this was within myself, within our school, within my community, this was the journey that I started at the end of my junior year. And I want to invite all of you to join in with me. You are all so dynamic. And it's time that we align our differences and recognize that you don't have to be a product of the falsely determined labels, ideas, and supposed tos. So, yes, I'm making paper cranes, but I'm making them in hopes to show you that you can do whatever you want with them. You can keep them, give them away, leave them on desks and hallways, on water fountains. You can make tiny ones and big ones and little baby ones and gigantic ones. You can make more, you can make less, you can stop making them. You can give them to random children to make them happy. You can put them on your shoulder, you can make them your best friends, you can bring them to parties. And sometimes people will try to stop you and slow you down and tell you that you can't or you shouldn't or you're not supposed to. I have literally had people crush my cranes in their hands and stomp on them and try to destroy destroy them. But you know what? That's just a part of the process. That's what makes it so unique. That's what makes you so unique and strong and valuable. You have the power to do whatever you want with the cranes. You have the power to do whatever you want with you. And it's up to us as the city of Chattanooga to decide how we go about it. Now, whether this is through volunteering or traveling or becoming that teacher or an artist or mother, the question isn't how many cranes are you making? The question is how are you going to use them to make a difference? Thank you.